how do we access exam three? So I get, ah, okay. So it should have been emailed to you as a link. So if you click on that link, it should open to the exam three study guide. Um, if it doesn't, let me know and I will fix it and I can email it to you as well, okay? All right, IT says I need access. You shouldn't need access if you sign in with your St. Kate's. So are you using your St. Kate's account to open it? It says I need access, we'll try, okay, yep, okay. <clears throat> All right, so exam three review. Um, it seems easy because it's like cardiovascular, respiratory, and digestive, but cardiovascular actually includes blood, heart, blood vessels, and then you have the respiratory and digestive. So it's actually quite a bit. So it's in terms of like difficulty, I would say it's about as difficult as the second exam. So make sure you set aside enough time for it. So for the logistics, it's same. Okay, so first, second exam, pretty much the same thing. The lecture exam has 50 questions, of which 40 are multiple choice, and 10 are fill in the blank. And then your lab has 30 of... Um, yeah, it's just 30, okay. And they're all identification, spelling counts, and <clears throat> for sure, if there's a pair of something, indicate right or left, um, and any parts of the name that you see in the PDF. So in terms of spelling, follow the PDF names, okay? Um, same thing uh, for all of these, you need to use Respondus Lockdown. Plus webcam. And it's really important that you use, you do a thorough environmental scan because if you get flagged, it, your environmental scan is what, you know, I, I, that's the first thing I go to, to look at. And if, if I see there's nothing around you, particularly your table area, um, then I just, I don't even care about the flags. Okay. Um, I still have to watch them, but your environmental scan is what, you know, is your proof. <clears throat> Any questions on the logistics? Um, professor, one question. Yes. So I often kind of get confused sometimes, uh, especially for the lab exams. Um, so like, for example, you know, this week we learned about digestive and, um, for example, the stomach. Um, like I know where the regions are, like say the cardiac region and the pyloric region, but sometimes on the second um, pages of the uh, worksheet, uh, instead of pyloric region, they want us to write like pylorus. So is that just a, like a matter of like which comes first or um, like how do I go about that? Either one would actually work. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Great. <clears throat> All right. So I'm gonna make sure that there's enough time to talk about the respiratory, but I will review all the others um, just briefly, if that's okay. So the first chapter that you'll be covering is the cardiovascular that includes the blood, heart, and blood vessels. In terms of blood, making sure that you know the functions, which include transportation, what is it transporting? That would be nutrients, gases, waste, water, and so on. What are we talking about in terms of gases? The carbon dioxide and oxygen. Thank you. So carbon dioxide and oxygen, okay? It also functions in protection. And it's great to know that it provides protection, but you need to know how, okay? So in terms of protection in, in the blood, it fights off infection. How does it fight off infection? With the white blood cells? Yep. Like the different types of white blood cells? Yes, ma'am. 
the different types of white blood cells. It also provides antibody protection. And what does that mean? What does antibody protection mean? What, do, what does antibodies do? Would this refer to um, the cell's ability to identify itself? Yes, perfect. So identify self from non-self. And how does it do that? It uses antibodies that can bind to what? How does it know whether the cells in your body are part of you and or, or not part of you? <clears throat> Would this have to do with, um, and this might be going back to a different system, but the way that um, they're like the markers, like the protein markers, as far as the self cells? Excellent. They're called okay. antigens. Yep. Thank you. I couldn't find the word in my <laughs> <laughs> So they're called antigens. So you have self and non-self antigens. And your body is bind to the non-self antigens. And that's how it alerts your alerts your immune system that, okay, something's here that's not supposed to be here. Okay. And then you have the clotting factors. What are the clotting factors? There's two of them. Like is that one? Um, so if, if you have a wound, um, your skin starts like coagulating. Yep. Well, so what are what what factors allow for that to happen? Uh, thrombocytes. Yeah. What's another name for thrombocytes though? The platelets. Yes. We don't call them thrombocytes anymore because thrombo meaning clotting, site meaning cell. So people used to think that platelets were cells, but we now know they're not. Um, so we know that they are not an actual cell. They're fragments of a cell. So platelets, platelets. And one more. <clears throat> What's another clotting factor that you learned about in blood? Globulin. Say that one more time. Globulin. Globulins are yeah. not because, well, let me explain. So you have the alpha, beta, and gamma globulins. The gamma globulins are also antibodies. So they, they actually fall under the antibody protection. So okay. globulins are not in terms of clotting. But you're close. You're really, really close. You're within the plasma protein. So which one allows for clotting? Is it the Is fibrogen? I heard fibrin. Fibrogen? Fibrin is correct. Okay. okay. Yep. So the two clotting fibrin factors in blood are platelets and fibrin. Any questions? Like, yeah, I have a question. Yes. Why, I, uh, this is Jane. Um, so you said the, globul the globulins, um, they, there's, three, there's three classes of the proteins and function as blood clotting and, and protection as antibodies. Yeah, so, that's in your script. Yep. And I, yeah. yep. And there should be like a little note at the end of that, not in the script okay. itself, but okay. because that's what they said in the, um, the, the, Whoever presented it said it in the script, right. uh -huh. <clears throat> but it's actually not quite correct. So in terms okay. of globulins, mm -hmm. okay, there are three types. There's alpha, mm -hmm. beta, and gamma. And gamma. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Right. gamma should go upwards, okay? So alpha and beta are transporting. Mm -hmm. So remember how we said that plasma carries stuff you know, from one place to another. So it's the yep. it's the alpha and beta globulins that is actually transporting things. But gamma globulin are response are um, same thing as antibodies. So whoever wrote that um, 
it, it wasn't quite accurate. So this is the accurate thing. But if on an exam, that question comes up and you answer it wrong, you answer it according to the script, I will definitely give you back the points for that. But this is the correct information here. Okay, good. Okay, thank you. Yep, and that's what you'll see in the textbook as well. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's just it's harder to go back and fix that whole video to fix just that one section. So I try to put notations of where there is mistakes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good catch, though. All right. So provides protection. It also provides regulation. And what is it regulating? By regulating the, the fluid volume, water, <clears throat> as well as components in blood, it's going to be able to influence blood pressure, blood pH, and a lot of other fluid volume related functions in the body. Okay. We also do, you can do um, in terms of what are the components of blood, you can do what's called a hematocrit. And what a hematocrit is, actually, let me ask you, I'm sure some of you already know, what's a hematocrit? So you take someone's hand, that's, that's a hand, you prick their finger, you draw their blood into a tube, <clears throat> and you put that tube into a machine called a centrifuge. So you put that tube in, and it spins the tube really fast. And when you spin something really fast, the components in that tube separate based on density. So when you put blood in here, you separate it, it's going to divide like so. The top portion is the least dense, and the bottom portion is the most dense. And this is how blood would separate, so into three areas. What's the top area most abundant? Isn't that the plasma? Yes, ma'am. That's the plasma. And then the least abundant, which is like less than 1%, is called in general the buffy coat. And the buffy coat is going to consist of two things. What two things does the buffy coat consist of? Is there water? Uh, no, water is in the plasma. White Platelets blood cells and, and leukocytes. Yes, blood cells. platelets and white blood cells. And you're absolutely right. White blood cells are also known as leukocytes, and you are responsible for knowing both terms: leukocytes and white blood cells. Okay, and then the second most abundant, making up about 45% of blood is what? The red blood cells. The red blood cells, otherwise known as? Erythrocytes. Yes, sir. Erythrocytes. Okay, so that's the components of blood. We're going to go through each component, um, not in as much detail, because I want to make sure I save enough time for the respiratory. But if you have questions, I believe there's a video that does go through all the elements um, in my lecture. All right, so red blood cells are also known as erythrocytes, and that's the one that we're gonna start with, red blood cells. And then we'll talk about plasma, and then we'll move on to the white blood cells, okay? So in terms of white blood, I'm sorry, in terms of red blood cells or erythrocytes, you need to make sure you know its function, its structure, and its life cycle, okay? So let's start with function. Either go ahead and talk or put into the chat. What's the function of red blood cells? Don't be shy. I know you're not shy. Carries oxygen from the lungs throughout the body. Yeah, so it transports gases. Okay, so the main function of red blood cells is to transport the gases. So you alluded to oxygen, but it actually also 
transports carbon dioxide. We're going to figure out why and how. Okay, so that's the main function. In terms of structure, can someone describe the structure for me? Like uh, this red, isn't red blood cell have like a discoid um, structure? Absolutely, I love that word, discoid. Okay, so it looks kind of like this, as a side view and as a top view like this. Okay, so it looks like a disc, a discoid, right? So we also use the term biconcave because concave means it dips in and it dips in twice, the top and the bottom. So another term we use is biconcave. Okay, why is it biconcave? To allow it to move through um, different size um, vessels of the yeah. body. So definitely easier to move around. Why else? Why else? Mm -hmm. uh, I would imagine it's going what it's carrying too. The volume on my new laptop isn't working really well. So can you kind of like shout at me? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm inside my, my, my clinic. I can't. Um, is, it, is it because of what it's carrying? The product that it's carrying, transporting? Yep. <clears throat> So it's biconcave to increase surface area. To transport gases. So it's biconcave to increase surface area to transport gases. What do you normally find in the center of a cell? Nucleus? The nucleus, exactly. So here, if it's really shallow, <clears throat> that means that there are no nucleus. Okay, so an adult red blood cell does not have a nucleus. What does that mean? What does a nucleus do for us? Let's review chapter two on organelles. What does a nucleus do for us? It has the DNA code. Yeah, that's right. So it has genetic information, that allows it to divide, in other words, produce more cells, Creates. undergo mitosis, as well right. as repair. Right. So it's because okay, it has no nucleus, and it has no nucleus because it wants to increase the surface area, it gives up the nu it, it gives up the nucleus. So no nucleus though does mean that it can't reproduce, it can't divide mm -hmm. and produce new cells, and it cannot repair itself, which is why it has a lifespan of how many days? 120. 30. <laughs> About 120 days only. That's relatively short. You have some white blood cells that are even shorter, but for a, a normal average cell, 120 days is really short. And that's because the red blood cells are moving around, <clears throat> moving through the body, through the blood vessels, to the cells, to the, not cells, but to the tissues. It's going to get damaged. And when it get damages, it can't repair because it has no nucleus, which is why its lifespan is 120 days, okay? In addition to not having a nucleus, <clears throat> excuse me, it also does not have a mitochondria. Why? Well, what's its function? You know this, what's its function? Like in gas exchange, it carries oxygen and carbon dioxide from the lungs to the heart. Yes, absolutely. It transports gases, right? And the one gas in particular is oxygen. What does mitochondria do normally? Uh, ATP. Yes, so it makes ATP. And what's the most efficient way to make ATP? How do you make ATP? Um, 
Well, in the muscles, you need oxygen for yes. the traction. Exactly, right? It makes ATP by using glucose and a lot of oxygen. So if its purpose is to transport the oxygen, you can't have it use the oxygen, and that's why it has no mitochondria. It's like me, trans. if you were to hire me to transport, I don't know, snicker bars, that would be bad because probably by the time I get to this, wherever I'm supposed to drop it off, I'd eaten all the snicker bars, okay? So that's why you wouldn't have a mitochondria in the cell that's responsible for carrying oxygen because mitochondria uses oxygen, right? So what does that tell you about the, how, then how does red blood cells get energy? So we know that red blood cells don't have a mitochondria because mitochondria uses oxygen to produce ATP. So instead, how does red blood cells produce ATP? Because it still needs some ATP. Is the globin, you know, is that the heme group? So, yeah, and there's globin, is that where we're going? Are we there no. yet? I heard someone else speaking though, very faintly. So, what was the other forms of respiration? You have aerobic respiration, but you also have anaerobic. Yeah. So your red blood cells is the only cell in your body that relies solely on anaerobic respiration. Why? No mitochondria. Okay. All right. Good job. So that's structure. So now let's do life cycle. Okay. So life cycle of a red blood cell. Let's start from when it's produced. Okay. So where are red blood cells produced? In the bone marrow. Yes, ma'am. As well as the spongy bone. Yep. Okay, so we can just say in, uh, we can say red bone marrow, or we can just say, well, you can find red bone marrow in several areas, but yeah, it's pretty much red bone marrow. And you're right, in the spongy area, as well as in the medullary cavity, but it's still red bone marrow, okay? So red blood cells are produced in the bone marrow. Okay. They're gonna survive for about 120 days. And then after 120 days, they die. Where do they get collected when they become too damaged? Liver and spleen. Yep, that's right. So the liver and the spleen. By the way, there's a nickname that I think was super cool about the spleen. It's referred to as the graveyard of red blood cells. Graveyard of red blood cells, because that's its job. It collects damaged red blood cells, okay? But anyways, so the red blood cells are broken down. And here's where we get into the functional unit of a red blood cell. What's the functional unit of a red blood cell? What makes a red blood cell work? Heme and the globin? Mm-hmm. Hemoglobin, <laughs> the heme and the globin. That's right, the hemoglobin, okay? So when a red blood cell breaks down, it's gonna break down to hemoglobin, okay? Now, hemoglobin is made up of two main structures. What are it, What is it made up of? Protein chains. Say that uh, one more time. Protein chains. Protein chains, yep, okay. So let's draw Four. those out. Do you have... Protein chains here, protein chains here, protein chains here, and protein chains here. You got alpha and beta protein chains, okay? What else do you have? Um, globin. So the protein chains are the globin parts. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, wait, well, are you putting the iron in here now or not? 
I'm really sorry, my laptop's not working very well, so I can't hear you, but I'm assuming you said theme groups. So the theme groups look like this. They're like pinwheels almost. And there's four of them. So four heme groups that look like this. And the heme groups are made up of what? So we know that the globin chains are made of amino acids. What are the heme groups made up of? Iron. It's, it has iron on it, but what is it actually made up of? Is it, is it made out of protein? It, it is, it's a pigment. Okay, so that's why blood, you know, appears kind of bluish or kind of dark. It, it technically is red. So there's bright red and dull red. Okay, but it's, it's because it has a pigment. Okay, then attached to the heme groups, you're absolutely right, is iron. So you've got iron. So the functional unit of a red blood cell are millions of hemoglobin. What is hemoglobin made up of? The pigment and the iron plus the globin chains, okay? So the pigment and the iron, we know that iron has a high affinity for what? Are you referring to, because I can't see that. Oh, what iron binds to, that's what you're asking about? Yep, what does it bind to? I wanna say O2, but- And I you don't... are right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you're very intelligent. I always stick to your first answer, okay? So iron binds to oxygen. Let me give you an example of that. I'm not sure if you're, I'm sure some, there's some in the group that are old enough to remember metal cars. <laughs> okay. So in the, in the past, we had metal cars. And what happens over time is that it rusts. And the reason why it rusts is because the metal cars made up of iron bind to oxygen and, that, and thus it produces that rust. Okay. So we know that iron has a high affinity for oxygen. Okay. So that's actually what's transporting the oxygen. So that means that in every hemoglobin, how many oxygen molecules can you carry in each hemoglobin molecule? Four? Yes. Oh, one, one. Four. Oh. Why? Because you have four heme groups. Each heme group has one, one iron. So one iron binds to one oxygen molecule, which means each hemoglobin molecule can bind to four total oxygen. Okay. Then you have the globin chains. The globin chains here are made up of peptides and the peptides are essentially made up of amino acids. But the role of the peptides is actually to bind to what? Small amounts of what? You have, you've already taken care of O2. What do you have left? The protein? CO2. Okay. So technically a red blood cell carries both oxygen and carbon dioxide. And now you know how, okay? So going back to the life cycle of a red blood cell produced in the red, in the, um, okay. red bone marrow, lives for about 120 days, dies, gets collected by the spleen and the liver, breaks down to hemoglobin, hemoglobin is going to break down to heme groups plus the iron is going to break down to the globin chains. The globin chains break down to peptides. Peptides break down to what? Amino acids. Yeah, amino acids. And you know your body needs amino acids. So this is just going to be reused to to form new proteins, okay? The heme and the iron. The iron gets reused to make more hemoglobin 
or it's lost either in females during menstruation, which is why during menstruation, females can become slightly what? Anemic. Anemic, okay? Or trauma, like if you have a blood loss, okay? The heme, what did I say the heme was again? What's the heme? It's a pigment, okay. right? Sorry. That pigment is going to get converted to bilirubin and then go to the liver, gets processed by the liver even further, and then finally it's going to find its way in feces. Okay, so what happens? This is just kind of a, a little side note. Okay, so what happens, let's say, in newborns? Born. So in newborns, their liver isn't functioning quite right yet. So the bilirubin doesn't get processed. So what happens to them? What condition? Start with the J. Yeah. Or if there are folks that damage their liver, whether it's through fatty liver damage or through alcohol, what happens to their skin? that pigment stays in their skin and eyes and it causes jaundice. Their skin and eyes become yellow because that's the pigment. The pigment is a color, right? As heme, it can become red. In your skin and eyes, it can become yellow. In your poop, it becomes kind of greenish brown, brown green, depending on what you eat, okay? All right, so that's the life cycle of a red blood cell as well as the components and what they do. Questions before I move on to respiratory? Okay, spent a little bit longer than I hoped on that. So make sure you also go through um, plasma. Um, know the three plasma proteins. Just quickly, what are the three plasma proteins? Is that the ambulin, the fibrogen, and globulin? Absolutely. Okay. So the albumin functions in osmolarity and viscosity, fibrin, actually starts out as fibrinogen. And when you have a cut or some trauma to you, that blood vessel, then it gets converted to fibrin and fibrin is what leads to clots. And globulin, again, make a note of this because in your script is not quite correct. So in, in globulin, you have the alpha, and beta globulins, and these transport. Where your gamma globulins are your immunoglobulins, or else you can think of them as antibodies. So where do you find antibodies? If they're part of your plasma membrane, you find them in plasma, and then you find them in blood. Okay, you also have antibodies that are produced like within tissue, um, blood is a tissue, but within your, um, like your non-fluid, non okay. Then you have the white blood cells. Make sure, here's a mnemonic that helped me remember it, never let monkeys eat bananas. It's really cool because it also gives you the list of um, white blood cells in terms of most abundant to least abundant. So the most abundant would be neutrophils, followed by lymphocytes, followed by monocytes and eosinophils and then basophils. And then um, you have amongst them, you have the white blood cells that are classified as white, has granulocytes and agranulocytes. And the main difference is whether they have granules or not. 
the key thing that you're going to find on your exam are the functions. Okay, so make sure you know the functions. Like for example, I can ask if you have elevated white blood cells. I'm sorry, if you have elevated white blood cells and within the white blood cells, you have a higher number of neutrophils. What does that tell you? So increase in neutrophils, what does that tell you? You have an infection, but what kind of infection? It's bacterial, okay? So white blood cells, phagocytes, phagocytos, bacteria. Okay, so make sure you know the function. And then in terms of the heart, uh, make sure you can know the structure and function as well as the blood flow, okay? And it helps just to draw it out, label, and then do the, the flow chart, okay? Okay, you are also responsible for cardiac conduction. So make sure you understand the cardiac conduction in terms of um, how it starts. So you have the SA nodes, which are also known as the pacemakers. And then from there, it goes to the AV node and then the AV bundle and so on until you get to the Purkinje fibers that then stimulate the myocardium, okay? You are also responsible knowing, for knowing the EKG. So the P wave, the Q, R, S, and then the T, P, Q, R, S, and then the T. You should know what they represent. So what does the P wave represent? What does the QRS complex represent? And what does the T wave represent, okay? In terms of blood vessels, um, know that there are three main types of blood vessels and be able to compare and contrast them. To help you with that, I made a little table, okay? So essentially arteries always carry blood away from the heart. Um, you do not want to say that it always carries oxygenated blood because that's not always true. Okay, so kind of keep that in mind. Know the layers, the significance of each layer, and then the unique characteristics. So I made a table for you. Okay. All right, so to our question. So respiratory system, make sure you know the function of the respiratory system, the structure, um, if you had a chance to do that table, that would that is very helpful to study. Okay. Do you remember that table that I had you do for um, the worksheet? Okay. Make sure you go through that because it'll go through the um, the pathway of the respiratory system. What's the lining, and what's its significance or the characteristics. So if someone had asked about the respiratory system, is there one thing in particular you'd like me to focus on? So do you wanna go through the respiratory tract, ventilation, gas exchange? I, this is Cheryl. I had um, requested the respiratory system mm -hmm. for me, but I'm trying to think now. I can't remember exactly what. Oh, yes. Um, the atmospheric pressure. Um, like how that works was a bit confused. Not, it was just a lot. It was a lot of information in there, um, especially with the, the book and the, the diagrams as far as remembering um, when the pressure was going down mm -hmm. in the thoracic cavity versus up when you know that those exchanges were taking place. So yeah. if we could spend a little time on that part, that would be great. Awesome. That is one of the, the big things. So I will cover that. I'm sorry. I'm trying to move my laptop down. Okay. I need to get them to fix the audio. Okay. 
So we'll spend some time on, on ventilation. Uh, let's see. In the slide here. Oops. Insert new slide. Okay, there you go. Great. Okay. So a couple things in terms of ventilation that you need to know before we get started. Two main rules. One is diffusion. And remind me what diffusion is again. Uh, is that when, um, like, for example, they cross, like, the, you know, the synaptic cleft um, in exchange, like, let's say, oxygen and carbon dioxide cross diffuse to one another to uh, gas exchange? Yep. But how does it happen? What What's the mechanism of transport? Is that when like they go from high concentration to low concentration? You got it. Things move from high to low. Okay, so it moves across to establish a concentration gradient, right? So you want um, high to low until equilibrium. Okay, so no ATP is required for this. It just happens, okay? The second law that you want to know is Boyle's law. What's Boyle's law? Is this the one where it was like when you increase the volume, the pressure goes down? Yes. So Boyle's law is based on volume and pressure. being inversely proportional. What that means is when one goes up, the other one goes down. They're inversely proportional, okay? So those are the two basic rules that you have to understand, okay? Now, if we're looking at sea level, okay? Here's the mountain, here's the sea. So at sea level, you have the atmospheric, atmo atmospheric pressure. So this only works when you're at sea level, okay? If you're at higher altitudes or lower altitudes, then that changes a little bit. But at sea level, the atmospheric pressure is about 760 millimeters, okay? All right, so here you have thoracic cavity, right? So you have the intercostal muscles. Do this. Oop, time level, okay. So you have the lungs. So you have the pressure inside. And then you have this muscle right here. What do we call this muscle? The diaphragm. The diaphragm, yep. And then you have muscles around here as well. And it goes across, but I don't want to cover the lungs, okay? So you have a set of muscles, okay, that play a role in this as well. So you have the intercostal and you have the diaphragm, okay? So in order for ventilation to occur, so in other, in other words, if you want the air to move in or out, you can you change the atmospheric pressure? No, you cannot. But what you can change is the intraoral pressure. Exactly. Okay. okay. So you can change the interpleural pressure. And I'm just going to say for short lung pressure. Okay. Oh, my pen stopped working. Okay. So put that back in. My mouse writing is going to be a lot messier, so I apologize, but you have the lung pressure. Oh. Okay, so your lung pressure as well. That one you can change. 
So if you want to either inspirate or expirate, you have to change the lung pressure. And you know that in order to change the lung pressure, you have to change what? Like, is that like your max inspiration, exhalation? Yep. So, but in order to, to have that occur, you, cause you, there's two pressures, right? There's the atmospheric pressure and then there's the interpleural pressure, your lung pressure. You can't change the atmospheric pressure, but you can change your lung pressure. But in order to change the lung pressure, what do you have to change? Because pressure and volume are inversely proportional. In order to change the pressure, you change the? The, vo the volume. Yes, so you change the volume of the lungs. And you change the volume, it's not changing the volume of the lung, but you know, the inter, inter, um, interpleural um, pressure. So you change the volume of the interpleural pressure, or the, the lung pressure, okay? And you do that by using these muscles. Okay. Professor Boo, can yes. I interrupt just one moment? So when it comes to the interpleural pressure, as you just said, it's not the lungs itself. Is it like the interpleural pressure is within the, the pleural cavity? Yes. The, gotcha. Okay. Thank exactly. you. Exactly. Yep. So you can change the diaphragm by contracting it or relaxing it. So when you contract it, what will happen to the diaphragm? So the diaphragm is normally arched upwards. So when you contract the diaphragm, it actually shortens and moves like this. Okay. So when the diaphragm contracts, it's actually creating what in terms of volume? It's going from here, the purple line to the red line. Increase. So what did it do to the volume? More volume. Say it one more time, I'm sorry. I can't hear I, you. I'm sorry, more volume? Exactly. So it increases the volume, okay? So if you increase the volume, so by contracting the muscles, contract the muscles, you increase the volume. And if you increase the volume, what happens to your interpressure, um, in, interpleural pressure? Because they're inversely proportional. So if you increase the volume, you decrease the pressure. Right. So then that makes the, the lung pressure, the interpleural pressure. Um, Professor, is that when, like, let's say the atmospheric pressure is greater than the intrapolar pressure? Yes, in the lung? we're getting there. So hold on to that, Aaron. So okay. the lung pressure is actually going to move to about 753, or 56, actually, sorry, 56 millimercuries. Okay. So when you contract your diaphragm, it causes the volume to increase and when the volume increases it causes the pressure to decrease making the lung pressure the interpleural pressure 760 millimercury now if you compare the atmospheric pressure to the lung pressure which one's greater the, i'm sorry you were saying between yeah. the atmospheric pressure and the, um, when you compare the atmospheric pressure to the lung pressure, which one's greater? The atmosphere? Exactly. And in diffusion, things go from where to where? High to high. Oh, high to low, sorry. Yeah. Okay, exactly. So now that means that the air will be sucked in. That's supposed to be an arrow. Okay, the air will move in as a result because it goes from high which is the atmospheric pressure to low, which is the in, in, interpleural pressure. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, if the diaphragm can relaxes, let's choose, what color should we choose? Let's choose yellow. So if the diaphragm relaxes, it elongates. And when it elongates, it's gonna push it up a little bit like so. 
So when the diaphragm relaxes, it pushes up. And when it pushes up, what does it do to the volume? Decrease. Yes. So volume decreases. And if volume decreases, what happens to pressure? Atmospheric pressure goes up. No, 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 not atmospheric pressure. Interpleural pressure goes up. Yeah, there you go. Interpleural pressure goes up. That makes the pressure of the lungs or the interpleural pressure about 763 millimercury. So now, which is higher, the atmospheric pressure or the interpleural pressure? Interpleural. Yes. And that is what causes the air to be pushed out in expiration. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Did I yes, answer your you question, so Yes, thank you so much. Well, yeah. I mean, because the course doesn't go into specifics, I'll go through the book and we can, I guess, me, uh, my concern was like the numbers and how these numbers came about, but I can always do some more in-depth reading for that. But the volume part is what confused me the most. But then I also realized um, in your respiratory lecture that you had email, which I didn't get to till after the fact, I didn't see that link. You actually helped to explain this really well um, okay. with, that, with that volume, because you made a comparison of like marbles in a, in a can or like a bucket. Um, and how if the bucket's bigger, you know, the, the marbles have more room to, to move, you yes. know, and that's like that, that's that increase in volume, decrease in pressure, and then a smaller bucket, the same number of marbles, smaller volume, increase in pressure. So that actually really helped to kind of put that in place. Perfect. Yes. Perfect. Okay. So that's ventilation. Um, that's a really good one to review though, because that's physiology and you know physiology is gonna be on the test. Okay. Um, another thing you wanna make sure you know is gas exchange. That's, that's an easy one to kind of bypass, but gas exchange is also very important. So make sure you, sure you understand gas exchange um, as well, okay? And that's the pulmonary, my pen is working again, pulmonary and systemic gas exchange. Okay. You also wanna know how gases are transported. So gas transportation. How, are, how is O2 transported? How is CO2 transported? Okay, and how is it transported the majority of the time and so on? So make sure you cover that as well. In terms of digestive, um, this one's a lot. It should be fun though. It's, it's a lot, but it should be fun, okay? So describe the function of the digestive system. Make sure you understand the tract, just like you did for the respiratory. Um, remember that we had the, um, the sheet that you can write down like the pathway and such, okay? But you also wanna know the digestive tract itself. So here's the digestive tube. If you were to cut it in half, how would it look from um, either mucosa to serosa or serosa to mucosa? Okay, so know the order from deep to superficial or from superficial to deep, okay? And also on a test, you wanna make sure you know exactly what I'm asking for, read it carefully. Am I asking for the order in terms of deep to superficial or superficial to deep, okay? Make sure you know the movement um, of fluid through the body so structurally, it moves through the mouth first, then the pharynx, then the esophagus, then the stomach, um, and then the small intestine, and then the large intestine, okay? So that's how it moves through your digestive tract or your alimentary canal. You also wanna make sure you know the chemicals that play a role in digestion. In your book, there's a really nice picture that shows you like, protein, lipid, and carbohydrate. And as those, each of those chemicals move through your body, um, what's happening? What enzymes are responsible for breaking what down? Okay. You know, I think when I email you, um, let me make a note for myself. When I email you this PowerPoint, I will also email you that 
that image, image of that chemical digestion. So you don't have to go look for it in your textbook. Okay. Um, I did a similar one here, but more of an application. So if you're eating an almond joy, and by the way, that's my favorite candy because it has all of everything that you need. So it's got the almond, which is the protein, the chocolate, which is the carbohydrate, and the coconut, which is the lipids, right? So if you were to eat an almond joy, what would happen as it moves through your body? So you can see that I start with the mouth, through the pharynx, through the esophagus, the stomach, and you would continue with the small intestine and so on, okay? And here I talk about what happens to the certain parts and through what chemical. So things like salivary amylase, pepsinogen to pepsin, hydrochloric acid, and so on. So that's kind of the sum of the digestive system, okay? Do we have any questions? I think I, I should have time, and you feel free to leave anytime you like, because I know I'm going over the time that I allotted. Um, but if you want to stay back for a few more minutes, at, I think I have time for one more question, and then I will also want to do the um, review questions with, uh, with all of you as well. Anything you want to go over? I think I have time for one more question. Um, this would just, just putting all of our terms that we've learned so far into place because I was, you know, in our the worksheet because that's what I chose for the last assignment for the digestive system um, as far as the defecation process. Would that be an example of the positive feedback loop? Defecation system is also more of the negative. It senses a change and then it tries to bring you back to normal. Ah, I see. Because I was thinking of like that whole motor, um, like the way that the diagram looked, it was like the sensory input from the, the rectum was going back in the loop until it was expelled, kind of like birth in mm -hmm. a way. That's what it looked like. That's why I asked. I was like, oh, well, that makes sense because of the body kind of like trying to push its way out until it it happens so but it would be negative yeah it should be more of negative because it's part of your rest and digest i see okay yeah. okay yeah. yeah and another thing that i usually add it in terms of that is usually positive well all the time positive feedback oftentimes can be life-threatening right so yeah, I mean, if, if it leads to diarrhea in that way, it could be, but normally... That's what I was thinking. Yeah, 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 yeah. With with diarrhea, it's more of like your body sensing, sensing a toxin and it's trying to get rid of it. Okay. But in okay. normal defecation, you know, if it's full, it empties it. That's it. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's a great question, though. Other questions? All right, so let's go through. All right, so let's go through.